All right, it is now time for me to introduce my guest for the morning. He called in, as I said, at the appointed time. He is an educational keynote speaker delivering powerful speeches that motivate the audience. Founder of Concentric Educational Solutions, located in Washington, D.C., currently writing a memoir titled From Prisoner, All Right Now, to Principal. Only God can judge me. Dr. David L. Heber is a passionate educational keynote speaker delivering powerful speeches that inspire and motivate the audience. He provides strategies and tips that can be applied to life immediately. Davis has, our David has presented to and worked with schools, universities, and organizations across the nation. With David's humorous and down-to-earth style, he's able to connect with any audience. However, David's passion is working with young people, specifically African-American and Latino males. His journey to success has been non-traditional in every sense. David uses his personal story of grief, poverty, incarceration, and redemption as a means to connect with students and challenge them to recognize their potential, honor their promise, and fulfill their purpose. In addition to speaking engagements, David is the founder of Concentric Educational Solutions, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit organization that provides student support services. As the founder of Concentric, David has collaborated and consulted with over 100 schools across 20 states. David graduated from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania with a triple major in history, black studies, and education. He went on to receive his Master of Arts in African American Studies from Temple University and his Doctorate of Education in Urban Education from Morgan State University. All right now, while attending Lincoln University, David pledged as a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. He was drawn to the Kappa Alpha Psi motto, achievement in every field of human endeavor. After graduation, David learned how to truly incorporate the principles of achievement into his life. David's greatest achievement in life is his family. He is a father of three wonderful children and a husband to Chantel Heber. His family is truly the purpose of his life. David enjoys reading, watching sports, and working out. Welcome to the Reading Circle Microphone, Dr. David L. Heber. Dr. Heber, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I am well, thanks. As I said, even better. Because, you know, when, when you're on this end, on the radio host end, you're always nervous whether or not the guest is going to call in or not. So I always feel like a zillion percent better after I pick up the telephone and the guest is there. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm once a, you catch me in the morning. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a morning person. Oh, that works. So once I know all the equipment is working and the guest is on the line, I know we can roll on from there. So it's interesting. As I read your bio, particularly the piece where you said you're working on the book, from prisoner to principal and I, I, I that leaped out at me because prior when it, on my college days I was actually a custodian at my alma mater actually the high school I graduated from I was a custodian there while I was in college wow. and now that I'm a principal so people always tease me about coming from custodian to principal and now <laughs> I'm seeing you from prisoner to principal so I know that's going to be an interesting story and one that the listening audience and myself, we want to hear because many times, as you know, um, it's either one or the other. Either you're a prisoner and you stay there or either you're the academic and you're the principal and you've always headed that way or whatever. But you have an opportunity to see both sides. You know, no, absolutely. Um, in, in many ways, I've been very fortunate. Um, by no means am I advocating that people should go to prison uh, to try to <laughs> to try to find their way, but where with the circumstances and the events that were occurring in my life, I think it really gave me an opportunity uh, to see so much more than I had been ever had been exposed to and see the dichotomy that, um, that actually existed in life. I was, I was raised solidly middle class with, with quote, you know, quote unquote middle class values. Uh, we were, we were definitely a working class and my family and my, uh, my parents instilled the values of hard work, but we were, we were really sheltered. And going to prison uh, after the death of my parents really exposed me to a lot of a lot of things that I had never uh, knew were out there. And th those experiences while we uh, while I was in prison set the foundation for me to be able to do this work in urban education and really understand that you know it, one of the things I'm very adamant about is that there are no experts in this. A lot of people will proclaim that they're educational experts. Uh, I'm an educational practitioner. Because what works on a Monday may not work on a Tuesday. That is true. Uh, and what works with one student may not work with the next. That we're is. All trying to, we're all trying to do this work together. Yes, indeed. And that is absolutely true. Because I tell people all the time in education, 
each day when I leave there and think that I've seen it all, the next day something else that comes up that says, no, you haven't seen it all. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that it's those reminders that uh, keep us grounded and keep us humble uh, about this work that we're doing with the, and with these students and the families that need so much support. Absolutely. And in terms of being able to talk about being in prison, I mean, that in and of itself is it's a courageous leap in terms of being transparent because you could just leave that part of the story out, but you're choosing to include that. Yeah, there, there was a time at the beginning of my life, uh, at the beginning of my career that I didn't want to be defined by those experiences. I, I didn't want it to be that because it was so close in, uh, in time. But as I've established myself and I actually have a career that I can go back to now, it's, it, 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 it does feel refreshing and it is, it, it is liberating in, uh, to be able to share those experiences and, and be transparent. And what, you know, one of the things that I try to share with educators is uh, the power of transparency uh, and authenticity. Um, I'm sure with your experiences and similar w- uh, with my experiences, with the students that we, uh, students across the board in general, but specifically students in, ur- uh, in urban areas, because they have to go through so many challenges and navigate the world with a different skill set, they can see through people who are fake. That's right. Young people say keep it at 100, being real, whatever. They know if you're not. That's correct. And, so, and they'll call you out on it. Yes, they you will. Know, <laughs> no, they will. And, and I tell <laughs> the, the staff that I work with all the time, I said, let me be very clear with you. There are two age groups that innately pick up sincerity. It is senior citizens and children. Mm. Those of us kind of like in the middle, you know, we kind of try to figure it out. But those two groups inherently know. And so since we work with children, I tell them all the time, the kids know sarcasm. They know body language. They know facial expression. They read between the lines. They may not be academically astute, but they know when you're putting them down, when you're trying to be Mr. or Miss Funny. So don't do it. And, yeah, and, and, and so they, they really do. Like you just said, they will check you on it if they, if they feel you are a fake or you're or putting on or when I was in the classroom, <laughs> David, I tell you, I got away with murder because yep. the kids knew that I honestly and truly loved them and care for them. I mean, I would put on all kinds of shows. I would make them think that I was angry. I would take chalk and throw it against the chalkboard and it would splatter. And <laughs> they never told, they never went to the principal or their parents on me. My colleague right next door would try the same thing and they knew he was just doing it, you know, trying to, they would tell on him all the time. The kids the know, time, yeah. they know when you're <laughs> sincere and when you truly love and care about them, they do. And it's, and it's, uh, it, that is, has been the, my, um, I think the greatest strength is just being able to connect with the, with the different audiences uh, across the board. And one of the things, again, I say, you know, this is about a conversation. This is not about me inspiring you or motivating you. It's about us sharing. And, and, um, uh, inevitably what always occurs is I take more from a conversation with a group of people or, you know, individually than I actually give because, it's a reminder of how much work is out there. I was with a, uh, a group of educators in Maryland on Wednesday, and we were specifically talking about um, at-risk students. We call it at-promise students, just students that the system right. doesn't know what to do, right? So they're over age, under credit. And one of the things, uh, there, there's, a, there's a wonderful brother out of New York doing this work uh, in a different space. He's working around policy. His name is Glenn Martin. Uh, he's president of Just Leadership. And basically, he, he, was, uh, he spent six years in prison, but he's talking about, re, uh, he's actually uh, championing closing Rikers Island, but he's talking about the reentry process and all that. And he has a, a powerful quote, and he said, those, of, uh, those, of, those people who are closest to the problem are furthest from the solution. And I was suggesting that to our educators, and it's not because of a lack of heart, but a lot of the students that we work with, they experience severe deprivation, severe uh, where they have to, where they're constantly in survival mode. And none of us in, in that room at that particular time, we didn't worry about, we, we're not worrying about, are oh, we going to eat tonight? Right. You know, we're not worrying about, are oh, we going to go home and will the electricity be on? And I said, we, we need to bring in some people who knows what that feels like, that sense of urgency, that sense of survival, to be able to connect with these young people. Because we asked the question, we, we uh, uh, general question, how many of us, in this room, uh, were kicked out of school. And, you know, three hands went up. The two students who uh, had uh, dropped out and gone and get their GED, and myself. And then we, the question was, how many people have their GEDs? And it was me and the two students. 
And I just said, we have to bring more people in to understand what, what schools need to do differently to, to reach students. So it, 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 it's interesting when you're just that transparent. But you have to truly believe in yourself and, for me, a higher power that it's okay to be transparent. No, and that's – see, let me tell you why, and I, and I agree with you and what you said a couple of minutes ago. And listening audience, please be very clear on what we're saying. We're not advocating that you go to prison that is not what we're saying. But Dr. Heber can connect with some kids in a totally different way that I can because he's experienced it. Because and and for the person receiving that message, it will blow them away. Because it's kind of like, well, wait a minute. If that can happen for him, it can happen for me. And the other thing it does is a lot of times, you know, uh, let me ask you a question. Are you, I, I think I know the answer to this question. I want to be sure. I don't want to be clear because I like to give people the respect that's due. Do you prefer doctor? Do you prefer David? Do you prefer Dr. Hero? How, how do you want to be David. addressed? The reason David I say is, David is doctor just means student loan. Right. No, I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. But it's, uh, no, it's, it doesn't. It does. I'm. I'm always going to be David. I. I I'm, I'm with you because I was the same way. If, if by chance I do pursue the doctorate and get it, I'm the exact same way. But I do know people that demand, and I'm, I get it. You like you just said the student loans and the time and everything. But you have some people that are totally caught up on that title, and if you don't call them by the title, it just freaks them out. So I, I always yeah. like to be clear. But I'm of the same manner. Like just I'm fine with Mark. I don't have yeah, to have right. all these titles, but. As I was saying, David can connect with some students and families in a way that I can't. And let me do in education, because this is the crazy thing, especially in urban areas. One of the things we would constantly get hit with was parents were they felt intimidated coming into a school setting because they felt as if, you know, those are the educated people. I'm not educated. So therefore, I really can't communicate with them. And where I'm going with this is once you get somebody that's transparent and say, hold it, stop, I've been where you are, and they and those walls come down. When because a lot of people hold educators per se up to perfection and they feel like they can't compete with them. But once you start showing that you're not perfect or you're imperfect, that that the floodgates open. Absolutely. So as you're going around and you're 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 spreading your message, I mean, what is kind of like your your feel? We talked a little bit before going on the air, but you all get a chance to travel around. And the person's name I was the had on I had on a couple of weeks ago was Keith Brown. I don't know if yeah. you and uh, Mister I'm Possible. Yes, uh, yes. That's who was on two weeks ago because I wasn't on the air last week. I was traveling, but the week before last, Keith was on the air and we had a ball. And now you and I are having a ball together as well. But it is a work, and you hit on something in terms of dealing with kids who are, for the most part, lack of a better term, in post-traumatic syndrome. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, you know, there's something now, I mean, it's, it's become, not necessarily cliche, I want to say fashionable. Uh, and, and I'm glad that conversations happen where we're talking about an education, uh, educating the whole child, the social-emotional Yes. Well-being. And so about... It, and this is how Concentric started when um, I went to uh, uh, a CMO, a Charter Management Organization in D.C. We were realizing a whole lot of our students were having challenges, even around attendance. And there was a, a tragedy in 2007 where four girls, four young girls, ages like 9 to 17, they were murdered by their mother. Um, and their bodies uh, were decomposing for eight months before anyone even noticed that they were gone. And this is because they were missing school, but nothing occurred. And wow. while we were in the charter setting, uh, unfortunately, yeah. yeah, while we were in the charter setting, we wanted to start understanding at a, de- at, a, at a root cause why our students were not achieving well. So we just, uh, myself and some social workers, we just start knocking on doors, and we just start visiting the homes of our children, completely unannounced, uh, in the clo- um, um in the neighborhood where the school was located, and we just branched out, and we just started collecting data. We weren't trying to solve the problem. We were trying to understand and get context of it so that we could do things differently. So what we knew is that we had to go beyond the traditional surveys or waiting for parents to come up to the school for whatever reason, and we went and knocked on the door. So that first year while we were with the uh, CMO, we conducted about 2,000 home visits. 
and we were getting some really good answers uh, and authentic and honest answers about what the school should be doing differently. So we started implementing the, those things, uh, and the attendance went up 22%. I mean, it was astronomical, and the suspensions went down, and we were able to build efficacy with our teachers. So then that's when I was approached by New School Venture Fund out of California, and they asked me had I thought about what, you know, taking this theory of change or this model other places. And it wasn't, at that time, it wasn't a theory of change or a model. It was just things that I, I thought that uh, made sense. And so we wrote something up, and we were the first black organization. And I, I say that very proudly because, in particularly in uh, the charter world in urban education, it's predominantly white company. Right. Uh, we were the very first company, uh, African American company, to get a grant from them. And now, what, seven years later, we're 50,000 home visits in across the country. And you said it earlier in terms of addressing the whole child. That is so important because you have kids coming to school and you have teachers and administrators for that matter who, for the most part, are clueless as to what that child went through before even getting to school. Absolutely. And I'm not saying I tell people, I'm not saying you're going to use what they went through as an excuse, but you at least have to be mindful of it as to why maybe they're not connecting with you. Two plus two equals four. Whenever you had a situation like you just described where the children were killed and nobody even knew. Yes. Yes. So, you know, it's unfortunate. It was it was yeah, it was very unfortunate uh, circumstance. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, so the more organizations and, and I told Keith couple weeks ago what what god has been doing this year for me through yousef and other people is he's been sending brothers and sisters to me on the air that is about this same mission and i said i was i've got to get together some type of a think tank or something because all of you have been on the show we've all discussed it there's got to be something we can do collectively absolutely to take it to the, to another level to whatever we're doing individually to come up with something collectively maybe it's already being done i don't know but all i know is this year i have had some dynamic guess in terms of what they're trying to do for children, young people, and education. Yeah, no, and there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a powerful cohort of people across the country, uh, people who are famous and not so famous, people who want to be on, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the shadows and behind the scenes, and people who want to be up front, but collectively working together, there's a lot of talent there. One of the things, and we need, we need, quite frankly, we need someone to really galvanize us because we're all working in silos. Like right. we, we, we may uh, bump into each other, but we, if we can do something more intentional, uh, because we, in every facet of this process, there's someone doing this type of work. Right. And so I agree with you. If we can get someone to galvanize us, to bring us together, to have these organized and intentional conversations, I think we will impact this work much quicker. Yeah, I mean, even when we were talking before we went on there, you mentioned the name Jamar Mills. I know Jamar. Whenever I was talking, to, I, we I, we all kind of know each other in our own little way because I started throwing names out in Keith's interview when I said Principal Kefaili. And he was like, oh, yeah, I know Kefaili. Yeah. You probably know Kefaili, too. Yep. Uh, I know Kefaili as well. Uh, there's there's a, there's a few of us doing this, and we all kind of, like you said, we're we're doing our individual things. But, but I mean, it's, it is so needed. It is it, it is so needed and because I see it every day um, in the school that I serve and we've come a long way. This is my I'm going into my fifth year there in September and we've come a long way from from when I walked in the door. But we still got a long way to go. And Absolutely. it Absolutely. is needed in turn because I see in the bio where you said a lot of your focus is on the African-American and Latino males. And again, that is a focus that is so needed. And I tell people all the time. With our kids, the, the bulk of them, not all of them, but the bulk of them are being raised in single-family homes, which is usually the mother. So they're, they're accustomed yeah. to female voices. Then they get to school, and most, most schools, the predominant gender of the teachers are female. So they're hearing more female voices. So once they now come into the contact of the male voice, it's a totally different response. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think what we can, I think what, what our experience has been, and it, you know, going, I'm, I'm glad you, you you brought up the concept of like this network, but being very intentional about it is one of the things that I say is I was not a principal long enough to train principals, and I'm very clear with that. I think you just become, you just start finding yourself as a uh, leader and administrator in year three or five. 
the first year is like, oh my god. Second year it slows down a little bit, it, but it's almost akin to sports. You begin right. it, the, the, the building begins to slow down, and you start getting some of that. Now, what I will say is that I'm really my expertise or my my experience has been around student support services, creating or, uh, systems and structures, and aligning interventions to that. But what we have to do in this space is be more intentional in saying, you know, something. I, I feel that you, my advice would be you need a, a, a principal coach, a mentor, a non-evaluative mentor, but, and I know somebody. What happens is in this space is if we see something that we can't provide, all too frequently we walk away as opposed to recommending someone we know who does this work. Right. And we just, gotta be, we just have to be better than that, whether it's, whether it's yourself, whether it's Jamar who has experience, whether it's Marco Clark. We, we, can, we can say, you know something, no, you should reach out to Marco because the other organization that may, uh, who not, do not necessarily look like us, that's exactly what they do. Yes, indeed. You're that's absolutely exactly right. That's how, that's how you have a monopoly <laughs> right. in, these, in, in these urban districts of places like, um, you know, uh, whether it be Teach for America, and I've worked for Teach for America, or TNTP. Uh, they, they, I mean, they're all connected. Right. No, you're absolutely right, and and I could not agree with you more because I've been. Patterson was a state takeover district, just just as Newark. I mean, Patterson and Newark yeah. ran about the same times, and as a part of that, we were appointed various mentors. And in the beginning, I was kind of resistant to it, but as it turns out, it wound up being a wonderful thing. Matter of fact, I would always tell my mentors and coaches, I said, "Now look." My expectation is you're going to make me the best damn principal out there. <laughs> Absolutely. And Absolutely. they would all, we'd have a good laugh about it. But true, I mean, I've had two or three over the last few years because each year they, they change up. But they've always offered very good advice. Like you said, non evaluative. You're like, you know what? Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? And ultimately, when I try what it is we've talked about, it does, we do wind up the better for it. So. Absolutely. By all means, if we can network in a way that says, you know what, call Marco, call David, call call um, Mr. I'm Paul Keith, call mm -hmm. whatever we need to do, Jamar or whomever, because the expertise is out there. It is a absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things, uh, one of the things that we were trying to do, um, but th I mean, I just didn't have the capacity four years ago. Is there's a specific, to, from my perspective, there's a specific skill set that is needed. I was a mentor, a principal mentor in Detroit for two years. Um, and I don't know, I don't know how it happened. They just, to be honest with you, the aspiring administrators, I gave a presentation to them around support services and they asked um, Teach for America Detroit, who was sponsoring this, if I could be their principal mentor. Um, and what we were able to do, though, is I had a cohort of 16, 8 and 8, but I had a, um, seven uh, African-American males. And what I focused on is that there's a different soft skill set to be an African-American male leader. Right. Oh, uh, and, and it's just one, you know, presentation. How do you come off as being competent and, and knowledgeable without being perceived as aggressive or angry? Correct. So, I mean, you, 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 know, how, you know, the thought about creating this, this network of people who have done this work uh, and growing this, this wealth of this uh, this population of future African American male leaders. So people like yourself, Jamar, and Marco, you know, can do things like this. Uh, Principal Khalif, but be very intentional with that. But what happens is, again, similar to what we're saying, I'm being redundant, is that we do things in so much in isolation as right. an individual. No, we do, and and again, hosting this show, I've been blessed to meet all of you, and that's why I yeah. like the notion of kind of seeing either. A webinar or either a, we get together in a hotel that's central somewhere and just kind of put our heads together something i don't know what but Absolutely. but there's there is there's got to be something there like you said that, that kind of remove the silos and kind of get us together and let's let's hit this thing in a united front um because and, and again in education in general you don't have that many african-american males to begin with certainly we could use more in the teaching ranks yeah um, oh yes absolutely because like i just said Many of our children, they have gotten so accustomed to the female voice that it's like it's almost like they don't hear it anymore. Yeah. And whenever uh, you know the gentleman I was telling you about that that's the Kappa, he's one of the few African. As a matter of fact, I think he's the only African American teacher I have in the building. <laughs> wow. From a teaching yeah. perspective, I think he's the only one. I have some men in there, but I think he's the only African American male. It's very few. 
And uh, it, it is a different response from the kids. But at the same time, like you said, you can't come across as angry because that's the stereotype. That's what folks are looking for absolutely. anyway. <laughs> I know, I know, absolutely. But I mean, you know, this, um, you know, I think I've grown definitely personally and professionally just by the, the countless, the countless interviews. Uh, and they're, they're, they're really non, the semi formal, non structured, um, interviews and conversations with the parents and the students in the comfort of their own homes and just seeing and just, and just living it because, you know, inevitably in, in education, we're, we're probably one or two steps away from even some of the, our childhood experiences, what we may have experienced, even if we haven't, if, even if we didn't come from much. Right. And it's, it's a constant reminder. We did some home visits um, yesterday in Baltimore and it was, it was just, it's just power. It's just always a powerful reminder. I mean, it was, you know, 97 degrees with 101 heat index. Right. And yeah, I mean, that's why everyone's outside because they didn't have air conditioning. Right. And it was, it was cooler outside. No, absolutely so, yeah. right. Because I tell people, one of the things, matter of fact, the driving force for me is the fact that an African American male growing up in the city of Patterson, New Jersey, if all the things that happened for me can happen for me, my belief is, it can happen for any one of the students that I serve. Matter of fact, that's what I'm expecting and looking for. Because Absolutely. the fact that, you know, you grow up in a Newark or a Patterson or a Camden or a Jersey City or whatever, the expectation is not that high, particularly if you're an African-American male. All right. Absolutely. So the fact that we could rise to the point where, you know, you're in education. And, I, and I've had so many experiences that it's just not fun. I just when I said I was out traveling last week, I just came back from China. I was oh, wow. over there for uh, eight days on a tour that I took some students. We t we, my wife and I and the principal of another school and a couple other adults, we took seven high school students. And they had an, an opportunity to spend eight days in China. And But if anyone had told me this young man growing up in Patterson, New Jersey, would one day be in China and other countries are traveling around the world, it's kind of like, wow, I'm like, really? Seriously? Come on now. But... It has happened. And so my driving force for the other kids is, look, if it can happen for me, we can make this happen for you. But you got to want it. And you got to you got to work for it. So forth and so on. But they have to be able to see it. That's powerful. That's powerful. And see, there's two concurrent strands there that I see. Uh, that's powerful. Right. So the one message that they can get from one group of people. Right. Is this is where I've come from. I didn't have to go to prison or, you know, lose everything to make it. I just had to make good choices. And I had to work really, really hard. Right. And we, again, like similar to what you said at the beginning of the show, like, no, we don't want you to go to prison. I want to be clear about that. But as we're having the conversation to prevent the, the, the concurrent conversation, is, okay, when you do make mistakes, these are the specific things that you can do to right. get back on track. Right. Yeah. And, and the truth of the matter is, like I said, a lot of times... And I didn't <laughs> because prior to coming into education, I did 15 years in corporate and it just wonderful opportunities, wonderful perks. It just wasn't doing anything for me on the inside. So I, I, I changed over to education where my heart really was to begin with anyway. And it's just Absolutely. it's been wonderful. But whenever I was in school for, you know, to, to I was doing the alternate route school, I told the dean, I said, you know, People don't really hold teaching in high esteem. They don't hold teaching. He said, oh, I beg to differ. Yes, they do. He said, yes, teaching still in this country is held in very high regard. And I didn't realize it until, you know, when I got into the field and I started talking to people. And I don't know if, if you've ever seen a kid, if they see a teacher or a principal in the supermarket, they go into shock. I mean, they don't think we're oh, human. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they, I mean, but that's I mean, and the same thing somebody told me not long ago was, you know, schools and teachers and principals you all get a chance to shape a community because yeah. think about it when that child goes home whatever that teacher has said or the principal has said in that home for that child becomes gospel and yeah. it is true because when the new math and all that kind of stuff came out the kids would come home and say look i know there's an easier way to do it no miss such and such said i have to do it this way miss i gotta do it this way miss such and such said Th that the kids go home and they talk about what their teachers said and what their principals said. So in that regard, it is held in high esteem. And where I'm going with the whole thing is because of that, a lot of people hold the educators, like I said earlier, into perfection and they feel like they can't get there. But whenever somebody comes across and say, do you understand I failed this course? Do you understand I went to prison? Do you understand 
I dropped out of college at the beginning, then I went back. Do you understand? Once you start having those conversations, I'm telling you, I started like for me, for a lot of my parents at the time, I, I just I, I I'd gone through a divorce and I just it just I just could not figure out what was going on at that time. But then I started talking to a lot of parents who had gone through that and the connection that was made. David was unreal with the parents that I made whenever I could say, you know what, I understand. I understand what it's like. Totally different conversation. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, one of the things that we, uh, one of the things that we have done, like when we do, when we do a, uh, a, co- a group conversation, I don't call it a presentation, but group conversation is what we'll say is we'll put up um, a T-chart. And on one side it says, um, you know, arrested 27 times. Uh, spent 27 months in prison, blah, 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 right? And then on the side, it says um, degrees and uh, has been a, a career-long educator, whatever the case may be. And we say, you know, and the answer is it's the same person. Right. And we, all of us have, we all have stories. We all have right. powerful testimonies. And when we, when we take off the mask, and it, it, it's appropriate now because Future has a song out called Mask Off, so the students can relate. Uh, when we take the mask off, we can get to the humanity right. and the shared experiences and the coll- and the collective stories. And those like those are the those are the conversations that, that we're trying to usher through to say, look, we we're, we're all one bad decision away from messing up our lives. I know that's right. So we're you know, all <laughs> adults and adults uh, and, and children. So I mean that is you know, that has just been really um, at the heart of what, the, the conversations that we've been trying to have. And they are, and see, the crazy thing about this, when you start talking with the, the, the higher ups into your districts, a lot of times what you get, when you start talking about things like we're talking about right now with the whole child and, and being transparent, you get a lot of, yeah, that's nice, but. Now, everything always comes back to the test scores. Everything comes back to the, you know, the assessments and this, that, mm-hmm. and the other. Not realize, because this is, I'm a firm believer that if I get this other stuff, I'll get you your test scores. Absolutely. If, 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 Absolutely. If, if I get you, if I, if I get that kid feeling loved and appreciated and, and cared for and supported, I'll get you your test scores. But a lot Absolutely. of times you get a lot of the, yeah, that's nice, but. Because I do a lot of this touchy feely stuff in my school. I don't care what they say. I, I I do a lot of touchy feel, and it's paying off. I mean, where whenever, like I said, over this is my fifth year in that particular building. I've seen it change over, even in terms of how parents are treating their kids. I mean, we we do a whole big thing on love in my building, and I started seeing parents dropping kids off in the morning, giving them a little kiss, saying "I love you." That wasn't doing that before. Um, but when you get, I mean, the kids, I tell people all the time, when I walk in the hallway, them kids make me feel like a rock star and it's not because I'm the principal. <laughs> Seriously. It is it's not because I'm the principal because the kids that I serve, like we said earlier, they have no respect of title. They have no respect of oh, no. age, no respect of person. They have no respect of none of that. <laughs> the, 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 the hey, that's, the mis- no, that's the misnomer, you know, that a lot of young, uh, <clears throat> educators experience. They think, well, well, I'm the teacher. They should respect me. Right. Well, uh-uh. No. No. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. No. It's no. Not. Because, and again, it is com- and it's community based and it's it's relational. I tell you because everybody always thinks, oh, it's a cakewalk to teach in the suburbs. No, it's not. They have issues just as well. Suburbs, yeah. herb, their issues may be different issues, but they're issues nonetheless. All right. Absolutely. But when you get into an urban area where kids, like I said, are in post traumatic syndrome, kids mm-hmm. who've seen their mother get beaten up last night or their father get stabbed or this that, and the other when they come into the school, they don't have an issue cursing you out. <laughs> no, no, they don't. No, no. no, no. It, 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 absolutely. And like when, when people get uh when people get into this uh education, one of the things that we say, or that I try to share with them, I said, look, if you, if you are signing up for this for Monday through Friday, eight to four, whenever school hours are, you're, you're signing up for the wrong job. Correct. Right. Because the, the, you work by the, cl- by the job, not the clock. Like Correct. It, 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 it's seven, it's seven days a week. Correct. It, it's literally seven days a week. And th- those are the conversations that we have with them. And so as, you know, as we're, you know, and I, and I learned that firsthand because um, when I was coming out of uh, when I came out of prison, I knew what I w- and went to Lincoln. I knew what I want. I wanted to be an attorney, right? Um, 
But then probably uh, my junior year when I was sitting down uh, with an alpha, uh, department, uh, Dr. Wachuku, who was the, the department chair, we started talking about, you know, the possibilities. And he said, hey, had you, have I ever thought about education? And at that moment, I started thinking about it, and I said, that's where I'm going to go. Yeah, so that, that, that was the change, and that, and I see that, and that conversation makes makes all kinds of sense to me because again, we need as many we need as many males, period. But then when you start breaking it down by ethnic group, we need as many African American and Latino males as possible because this is the thing, David, that I always get. Again, and I always base the fact that I'm in an urban area. Well, the kids are only going to rise as high as what they see. I see. Yeah, I, I, I get that, but they see me for five, six hours a day. They they see their teacher for five six hours a day, so they're getting a chance to see both sides. Now they they can make a choice. <laughs> so I, I mean I don't I don't necessarily buy into that argument because that's their environment or they're growing up in that and that's the only thing they see. That's as high as they're going to rise because they are getting an opportunity to see me in a suit, or if I happen to wear my dashiki that day, or if I happen to wear this that and the other, they are getting the opportunity to see another side to say you know what I want to be like Dr. Heber. I want to be like Mr. Medley. I want to be like, they do get that opportunity to see that. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that's the, you know, the, the important um, part that we have to make sure that we, that we model those things, right? So yes. As, as they're seeing it, and it's constantly reinforced. And for us not to get frustrated if they don't get the first five or right. right? And so it's not when we're, when we're working with, when we're working with young people, it's, we can't expect if we do A, we're going to get B. Sometimes right. if we do A, we have to go back to you. <laughs> or, 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 or I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's true. Just, it's not that clean. So I think we just have to be mindful of that. No, you're right. And the thing is with kids, when you think they're not listening, they really are. And I've had multiple examples of a kid coming back years later <laughs> or months uh, later. And I said, oh, you were actually listening. <laughs> I, no, oh, I, I, no, I get that all the time. And, you know, me uh, being a father has helped me become a better professional. Right. Put it that way. Uh, just seeing it uh, on a daily basis with, with my children and the things that they pick up and some of the questions they ask me. And I'm like, wow, really? Uh, you know, are, are you 10 or you, and 11? Because this is a very <laughs> complex question, I guess. Uh, but, and, and, you know, and I get that, I get that uh, experience across the board when I'm speaking with young people that they ask some very deep questions. Yes. Some very deep questions, and sometimes completely, you know, I'm, I'm completely unprepared for a question that deep from a student who is 12 years old. No, and and their understanding level, and again, that's why, and I had this conversation with Keith, it's not so much in the pity as it is in the push. In other words, I'm talking about expectations. A lot yeah. of times what I'll get is, oh, they can't do anymore. Yes, they can. Yeah. They, 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 yes, they can. Oh, no, that's about as far as they can do. No, no, they can do more than if you expect them to. And it it will. I mean, they will blow you away when you get into some conversation with them. They really will. I, I truly enjoy the, my teachers think I don't do nothing because a lot of times when the kid gets sent down for a disciplinary issue, I sit down and have a conversation with them and send them back to class. So, oh, Mr. Melee don't do nothing. As, and I mind you, we had one of the, a couple of years ago, I had one of the highest suspension rates, if not the highest in the district. <laughs> but still, Mr. Melee don't do nothing. No, no, no. I talk to him. But in that talking, I get an opportunity to hear from them and they get an opportunity to hear from me. And Absolutely. like you just said, some of the things that they will bring up in conversation or in questioning will blow you away. That's why I know academically they could get it depending on how it's delivered. And I, I think with with, uh, with the things that I've experienced, one of the, one of the questions I pose to uh, to people is I say, you know you know do you have a, a sympathy or empathy for our students? Because I said correct sympathy is not sympathy is not going to help our students. Correct, it's going to hurt them in the long run. I correct, say empathy is sympathy, but with accountability. Right, that's what I was talking about with the p pity yeah. and the push. Yeah. Two different you have things. To hold them accountable, yes, but don't don't feel sorry for these kids, right? Because the world's not going to feel sorry. For That's them. correct. Yep. It really is, and interestingly enough, I just finished reading a book yesterday. It's called "The Go Giver Leader," and a couple of one of the things I highlighted, and it says, "Whatever great parenting looks like, it is not about the parent. Great teaching is not about the teacher. Great coaching is not about the coach." And great leadership is not about the leader. 
And that kind of embodies what we're talking about this morning. Because a lot of people get it twisted. You know, teacher think it's all about them. The coach think it's all about them. The principal think it's all about them. But it's really not. Very true. No, very true. And I, I think that, um, you know, the more, again, the more that you can connect with, the, with students and the parents, is you, they, will, they will follow you. And once, and once you have their trust, Yes. You can take it, and, and, and that's one of, so for example, with someone like Marco, what Marco has been able to do, and I've seen this brother over the course of 20 years, wherever he goes, whatever magic, whatever magic power he has to be able to connect with parents and students, and he can push them to unbelievable levels because they, they, tr- they trust right. him. He's authentic. Right. And and you're right, and you know what that takes that takes and that's where we're constantly at odds with the superintendents and everything when they move principals around. That takes some time in terms of of like yeah. like I said, I'm going into my fifth year now. I can say just about anything I want to my parents now. As a matter of fact, I've had in parent yeah. meetings, I've had teachers come. I can't believe you said that to them, <laughs> and and they, and they didn't come back at you. No, they didn't because like you just said, once you've built that trust and and the the relationship and the rapport, they'll go with you. Yeah. And and then when you add the transparency to it, like, you know, I've had men come in talking about, you know, the whole thing with the separation and, and, and how the mother treats them and the brother, I understand. <laughs> and yeah. I'll start yeah. sharing my story. With, and it's, it's a whole different, you know, I've had, it just once, but it takes a little bit of time to get that. But you are right. Once you get that trust, once you get that, they'll go with you. They really will. And um, all of the elements must work together and that's why i said earlier if you focus just on the test scores if you focus just on and i know we're in the business of academics i know that's our business but we're coming with kids who may not focus on the academics because all of these other things that you described is going on and if you don't prepare people to deal with that that's why you keep having this disconnect absolutely and you know the conversation that we had the honestly have with ourselves in, uh, in education is one education across the board is the least one of the least innovative um industries, correct right and so a lot a lot of young people are bored and a lot of our techniques are very antiquated yes and two what, what we're saying to young people who are not fully cognitively developed right now right and, and they're growing and, and they're growing social emotionally is if you do this you will get something 12 years later Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and as adults, we, we can't do that. Like, it, we have a hard time. Right. So, we, we, so I mean, it, it's literally a 12-year uh, delayed response, and in some cases, 16 years or right. 20 years. Right. And so we just have to be cog- uh, cognizant of that to say, look, and, and start showing them what, what the incremental steps will be if they're doing what they need to do. Right. Absolutely. Right. So we, have to, we just have to change it the way that we look at it. And, I mean, I tell people, it's it's sad that we still are doing education basically like we did in the agricultural age. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we're in the education, information, the academic, whatever you want to call it, the, the knowledge age or whatever you want to call it. But we're still, for the most part, operating like we did in the agricultural, the industrial age, where we were around the agricultural time clock where you know we are putting kids yes. in grades where you know maybe maybe why do they have to be just because they're the same age in the same grade why couldn't you do it by ability level or interest level or i mean there's a lot of different ways to do this thing other than the way that we do it and you know with our so for example i was driving with my son yesterday and my son is asking me questions about the and it was a sports related question but the, the question was you know, can you, uh, Dad, can you name the top 10 uh, hit, uh, best players in every uh, NBA franchise's history? I'm like, w- w- where are you getting this? He was like, <laughs> you know, he, he has an iPhone. Right. So he's looking and he's asking. But they have the, the accessibility to information yes. is so much quicker now. Like, we, we, have, we have got to do better in understanding that. It is so, true. So, you know, so he's 10 years old and he's talking about Nate Archibald. And he's talking. You know, I mean, he's talking about uh, George Gervin, right? For the Spurs. I mean, it, it's just. We, yeah, we. I agree with you one hundred percent. We are really antiquated in our approach. No, it, and it's, and the approach is what it is. I mean, we have this battle. And as we go into the new year, I already kind of started hinting to the teachers, letting them know, because we always have this. You're speaking about the iPhones and the cell phones. We always have this battle of kids bringing the phones to school. 
and like, no, you can't use them. I said, okay, teachers, look, why don't we flip this on them? <laughs> why don't mm-hmm. we start using the phones as a response mechanism? Because there are a lot of apps out there that oh, allow yeah. the kids to respond to a question up on the screen from their iPhone. Like, what? Yeah. Let's let's use the phone to our advantage instead of constantly fighting them on it. <laughs> yes. But, and, well, you know, so in, 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 you know, I, I've seen this kind of across the country, right, unfortunately. In urban districts, we seek to control. Right. In predominantly white districts, they embrace. Right. So right across the bridge in Fairfax County, um, cell phones are embraced as part of the educational process. Correct. But for us in urban education, our students have to walk in line. They have to be compliant. <laughs> right. Now, I understand, you know, the safety issues and stuff like that. But once, the, once you get the culture right. the way that you need it to be as a, as, a, um, as a principal for the school, then you can breed all that in, in innovation and embrace all that diversity. It's true. I, one of, predominantly white districts, they're, <laughs> they're, right they're doing it. That's right. I, there's a young lady that I'm mentoring as, as a principal. And I visited her school. It's, it's a private academy. It's, I mean, literally funded by the alumni and by, I mean, you're talking like uh, NBA players, kids go there. That's, oh, wow. as a matter of fact, okay. one of the kids that I met there was a former NBA player and a player's child. And I'm walking through the halls and I come across this. I took a picture of it with my iPhone. It said four slash five slash six economics and finance. It blew me away. Oh, wow. And wow. so she says, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a club for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, economics and finance. I said, now I'm struggling to get kids <laughs> to know two plus two equal four, and you all are doing economics and finance in fourth grade? <laughs> wow. But wow. like you just said, the embracing, no desks in rows, none of, none of that. I mean, just a totally different feel. And so, you, uh, you know, one of, one of the people who, have been, uh, who has been powerful uh, in my life, uh, professional life and personal life, but uh, Freeman Robowski, president of UNBC. So he created a program 25 years ago now called the My Hall Program. And the the point or the initial purpose of the My Hall Program was to get more African Americans or underrepresented populations into into STEM. Right. And so he created a whole model, and now it's just I mean it's been replicated at Hopkins, Morehouse, University of Michigan, Cornell. But a fundamental premise or pillar of his program is the innovation on the approach, the labs, the hands-on, right. the moving around, the conversation, the, co- uh, the collective action, not one of us getting the problem right, but all of us getting the problem right. Right. And I, so, I mean, it's been an innovative approach, but, yeah. I can tell you now, just like we were talking a couple of minutes ago, the day of the lecture is over. Because yeah. the kids do not relate to a teacher standing up talking and they sitting there allegedly listening. It it yeah. just like you just said the hands on the the project. What one of the things we moved to in terms of math was having them break off in teams, and there was no one right answer. We're not looking for. The, matter of fact, if everybody came up with the one right, right answer, we're kind of frowning. At it. We want to hear how you solved it, even if it's wrong. How did your team go about it? How did your team come to that conclusion? That's because we're trying to. What we're really trying to do is create critical thinkers. Absolutely. Yes. That's where we're trying to go. We don't we don't necessarily want rote, even though rote has its place, but we want you to be able to think through a process. Even if the answer is wrong, how did you get there? Help me understand how you got there. Yes. And, yes. That, and because you, you, we're creating critical thinkers. Right. That's no, no, I, I think that approach is I think that approach is 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 much more appropriate for this group of students no it really is and and like you said a couple minutes ago with the information is at the fingertips that the young lady that i closed out prior to starting with you we were just having that same conversation in terms of technology uh social media and everything and when social media first came out i kind of frowned on it but then it dawned on me the light bulb went on that i could use social media to advertise for the show and the bulk of my guests over the last five, six, seven years or so have come from social media. And I was sharing with her because she was telling me, you know, her ambitions, what she wanted to do. So I asked, I said, well, have you ever reached out to the person that you want to be? And she's sitting there looking at me like, no. And I'm like, you have social media for whatever reason. I don't care if it's low profile, high profile, no profile. People respond on social media. 
Absolutely. I said, so why haven't you reached out to that person? Why haven't you reached out to them on social media? A couple of weeks ago, I did a career day at a high school, and a little girl told me she wanted to be a senator. I said, all right. I mean, she knew what she wanted to be. She, she didn't say Congress. She didn't say, <laughs> she, she didn't say council person. She didn't say president. She flat up said senator. So my question back to her was, well, have you reached out to Senator Booker? <laughs> Oh, wow, yeah. And she said, no. I said, well, I know he has a Twitter because he's one of my Twitter friends. He's one of my f people on Twitter. And I guarantee you, if you tweet him and say you're a high school student and one day you want to be a senator, I guarantee you he'll get back to you. But I yeah, mean, yeah, the, ex I the accessibility and the technology that's available today, I cannot think of a better time to be a student. I, no, I, no, I, no, I agree. And, you know, you, you, you don't have to wait anymore. Listen to what right. you said until you're in high school to think about what you uh, want to be or try to get for career day. The, the exposure is just, it's just massive now. Right. And so we can expose, we can expose these young people because they're exposing themselves because, right. because they have the accessibility that we can, we, we can leverage that. Correct. We just have to be sure we, we just, we have to, we have to embrace it and not deal with education the way that we've traditionally dealt with education for the past 150, 200 years. <laughs> this is true. I laugh because I see it all the time. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe we're still doing. I mean, there's this video. It's, it's, and you may have seen it. If not, if I get your email, I'll email it to you. But it's, it's this brother that did the video where he puts education on trial. Oh, wow. And I mean, it's, it's a masterful piece. If you haven't seen it, I'll, I'll email it to you. Um, where the brother literally shows how the same thing we were doing. Two or three hundred years ago, he is the same thing we're doing now in education. He he shows a, a um, an iPhone versus a rotary phone, and he shows other things that he compares a car to the horse and buggy, and yada yada yada. But then, when it comes to education, we're still sitting in desks in rows by grade level, by age level, by this that, and the other. So I have to say, it's a powerful piece. It really is. But he put he puts education on trial. Yeah, it, it, you know, fundamentally, if we can design things, uh, and and this is where I think, uh, where I wish we would go, um, particularly in urban areas, is that, similar to what I was saying earlier, is if we can get out of the mode of just compliance, hey. and uh, where we have to put everything, you know, that children have to be obedient to what we're trying right. to do, as opposed to, you know, taking the, their vast skill sets, and they have so many different uh skills across the board and embracing them and pushing them. Uh, I, I see in my children's schools, like the uh, fourth, fourth grader doing an internship uh, uh, at a vet, uh, at a veterinarian hospital. Right. I mean, just, just it, because she really likes pets and just getting the, her exposed to these experiences early on. I mean, and, and so, so I, I, I want to see that in urban education more. And I want us to, to, quite frankly, I want us to take back urban education uh, more. I, I know now in, in Newark, uh, it's going back to local control. Right. We're in the same um, boat in Patterson. Like I said, they're yeah, running yeah. about the same timeline. Okay. And, I mean, j just doing that. And, you know, so for uh, in Newark, what we're going to start doing August 1st is we're going to do a thousand home visits a month and bring that, inform and bring that information back to the schools. Wow. And, it's, and so we can say, okay. This, you know, one, it's informational, what, or whatever the school wants us to communicate to the parents, but the conversation and the honest conversation in their home and bringing that back to the school-based uh, leadership teams and saying, this is what your parents and your students are telling you, telling us you, they need to be successful. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're definitely looking forward to the, uh, to the work in Newark. Well, again, we're running along that same line. Interestingly enough that you would say what you were just saying about hearing from the community. Because one of the things, the discussions we had with local control in terms of school boards, at the end of the day, it's the community that really should kind of guide where the school board goes, not the other way around. Absolutely. And, and uh, somebody had brought up an example in her town. The school board members just flat up said, we don't have any time for listening to that or we're the ones who call the shots or something along those lines. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but it's like, that's one of the concerns. Like, if we go back to local control, they really need to listen to what the community is saying. Now, at the same time, the community needs to be able to present its case. 
Yes. Because a lot yes. of times you think parents, you know, they think because they go to the school board meeting and they yell the loudest or curse the most or call the most names, they think they've done something. When the truth be told, is like, well, no, they've kind of shut down once you call them that last name. <laughs> but- no, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> but, that's, but that's also the opportunity. I agree with you 100%. Um, we're, we're funded, uh, we're partially funded by an organization called Margaret Casey Foundation out of Seattle. And part of what that funding does, it allows us to, one, supplement the gaps because a lot of, uh, a lot of schools that we work with may not necessarily have the resources to, uh, to work with us. So we, we're able to bring something to the table and match, you know, to match their resources. Right. But what, uh, the purpose of the Margaret Casey Foundation is to build the capacity of the community to do and advocate on their own behalf. There you go. Right, to teach them. So if they, they, if, they, if they don't know about policy, we have to teach them about policy. We have to teach them about, hell, we have to teach them about Robert's Rules of Order. Right, I mean, I mean, right. All the way down to the base of the beginning to say, okay, yes, you have valid feelings, and you have valid points, but it's, the, it's similar to what you just said. It's how you present them. Correct. And so it's, a, it, it's the advocacy and building that capacity in the communities and in the homes with, uh, with the families so, so that they can lead this work for themselves. And so, yeah, that, that's that's been one of our um, one of the big because a lot of times what will happen in particularly in urban areas, the parents won't start coming out until the decisions, quite frankly, have already been made. Correct. So yeah, yeah. so you're coming to the school board, but guess what? There was a meeting before the school board, right? Meeting, but the decisions are going to be have been made already. That's correct. Yeah, so you can yell, scream, curse, whatever the case may be. Decisions have been made. You're 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 <laughs> you're, you're playing checkers, and they've already played checkers. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So true. Well, we've come down to the end of our conversation. It has been a wonderful one. And what I do, David, at the end of <clears throat> the interview is I turn the mic off totally and give the guest the opportunity to promote. You know, like in your particular case, it would be Concentric Educational Solutions or your upcoming book, From Prisoner to Principal, Only God Can Judge Me, or Where You're Going to Be. Like I know you've been talking about, you're going to be doing some work in the Newark area, but it's your chance to promote. The only thing you can't say is a dollar amount, but anything other than that, you can promote, yeah, shout out your yeah, family, yeah. anything else. But I'm going to turn the mic off, and the mic's yours. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity for, um, for all those who have tuned in and are listening to the conversation, um, similar to what we, we talked about at the beginning. None of us are experts in this work. We're practitioners trying to figure this out. Uh, I've been uh, very fortunate uh, in the people that I've worked with and, and the growth of Concentric to work with families and, and students and, and districts and schools to try to figure out what supports are needed for students and families to be successful and to advocate on their behalf. Um, although home visits are one of the things that we, we do and we do well, it's just the it's the very it's one tool in a large collective toolbox that we have to leverage. Um, I, I would love to build the opportunity to have conversations with any district or schools who are interested in just getting better and trying to figure out uh, solutions to a, a very common um, problem and uh, the different challenges. And feel free. Our website is www.concentriced.org. That's concentriced.org. And more, most importantly, I love to speak with people. So anyone can feel free to just give me a call at 202-330-1753. That's 202-330-1753. I look forward to hearing you, and I, I'm truly humbled by the uh, opportunity to share and have a conversation. No, I've recorded it, and it'll be a part of my YouTube archives. I'll also get a link to you that you can use however, which way you want. And I've enjoyed the conversation as well. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm building a lineup here. It's almost like a baseball team lineup. I'm yeah. getting a, I'm getting a yeah. lineup card now. <laughs> <laughs> that that I'm going to I'm going to send out a mass email to everybody on the lineup to see what can we come up with. Um, and that's, no, that's a wonderful idea, and quite frankly, you, you may be the one to galvanize this and bring us together. Yeah, I'm, I'm down and strategize around this work. Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping so. It's kind of like like I told Keith and a couple other people. Is it's that's where it feels like God is leading me. I'm not not real clear on it yet. It's just that the the people are coming in the path and the conversations we're having, um, and if nothing else, just to get all of us in one room, that collective efficacy would have to be powerful. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. I, I look forward to it. However, I can be supportive. Well, same here. So whenever you, when you coming up in August in a couple of weeks? Yes. Yes. 
Yes, I'll be up there the last week of July and all through August doing uh, home visits, me and my team. Okay, I might have to see if I can shoot down to New York. Maybe, maybe we can catch up with each other and do lunch or something. Um, oh yeah, or well, I can just come to Patterson because yeah. I need to meet. Uh, I'm meeting with uh, Jamar. Oh, you meet with Jamar? Right. Okay, well, yeah. we have to see if we can hook that up then. All right, sir. Have a wonderfully blessed day, week, month, year, life. Because <laughs> the work that we're doing, uh, the one thing about education, I tell people all the time, is you honestly, truly get a chance to leave a legacy. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I appreciate it. Keep doing the uh, keep uh, keep doing the good work. I look forward to connecting with you. All right. Take care, and best to you and yours. All right, be blessed, good brother. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Take care. All right, another powerful educational reading circle.